Hey guys, how the hell are you? Time for an all new unbiased gear review. And yes, it's finally time that we did another base review. This is the Infinity multi scale four string from Red Sub Bases. First, some specs on this instrument. We have what the website refers to as a USA basswood body with a bolted on maple neck and what they refer to as a thermal treated maple ply fretboard. More on that later. 24 extra jumbo frets. We have a multi-scale design that is 35 and a half inch on the bass side, 34 and a half inch on the treble side. Single saddle bridge design. We have two humbucking pickups, and we have an active EQ section. So first of all, a little backstory as to what led to me initially purchasing this instrument. Recently, I've been looking for a low-cost alternative for a multi-scale bass. I wanted something relatively inexpensive that I can eventually convert and tune this down to super low tunings. I'm going to be eventually throwing on some bridge cable 85 through 170 strings on here and dropping this sucker down to like F tuning, but that's going to be the subject of another video. This was something that I've been asking internet, Facebook groups, etc. You know, hey, what can you guys recommend? Is there anything out there that's a lower cost alternative versus Court and Ibanez and what they offer? And a few people recommended this, and a few people had some very, very kind of mixed things to say about it. I've read some people that have had fantastic luck with this thing, that think it punches way above its weight. And I've also read that a lot of people got instruments that had issues with them, but I'm not going to focus necessarily on what they went through. I'm going to focus on this instrument that we've got in front of us. By the way, it should also be worth noting here that yes, I am fully aware that this is a really inexpensive instrument. It is made in Vietnam, not even made in China or Indonesia or anything like that. It's made in Vietnam. And I know a lot of folks in the comment section are going to be like, well, hey, what do you expect? It's a low cost instrument. That being said, there's not really a whole hell of a lot out there on this as far as giving an objective fact-based opinion on it and I just figured hey why don't I take the plunge purchase it and I'll just give you guys my gut reaction to it and tell you what I really and truly think about it so needless to say am I expecting this thing to be a masterpiece in Luthery not by any fucking stretch of the imagination but I'm hoping and praying that it punches above its weight and that I at least get something that is worth owning, that plays relatively okay, sounds relatively okay, hopefully for the money that I spent on it, which was not a lot. So my first initial reaction upon taking this instrument out of the box is relative to how it felt. Like I thought it looked really, really cool. I do definitely dig the aesthetic of this instrument even though I think that the body itself feels like it's maybe a little smallish, just a little bit. But my initial reaction upon feeling the back of the neck, upon feeling the fretboard, et cetera, et cetera, is man, this thing does kind of feel cheap. Now, do I mean that it feels cheap like a piece of shit? No, I mean it feels cheap like, 
You know, like when you go to the pawn shop and you see these ancient relic instruments that are hanging on the wall, not even Charvels, but like these sort of Charvel, Washburn, Jackson-ish instruments, various knockoffs and whatever that guys would get just to play in their bar bands back in the late 80s and early 90s. And then at some point they sold the instrument because, well, they've given up on the dream, time to raise a family. So now it sits hanging on some wall in a pawn shop. And then you go to pick up that instrument and it just feels kind of rough and kind of neglected. That's kind of the feeling that you get from this instrument. Is it something that a few people dig? Is it an acquired taste? Yes. Is it something that necessarily I like? Not really, which is why I tend to go for higher priced instruments normally. But what I mean by this is like, if you take a look at the back of the neck, the way that the finish is there, it does feel like a polyurethane satin finish, but it is a super thin, super not buttery smooth poly satin finish. It just feels like something you would find on like a cheap $200 instrument, which is kind of what this is. This instrument is in the ballpark of about 260 to 270, just depending on exchange rates, because this is coming from Gear for Music, which is a UK based music retailer. I believe this might be one of their house brands, but as a result, they're able to sort of pass on the savings to us a little bit, add on the shipping fee that I paid for it, and I ended up getting this instrument for about $350. The fretboard is probably the next thing I wanna take a look at because the website lists it as being a thermal treated maple ply. I don't know what the hell that means. It's certainly not roasted maple like they have on some of their other instruments like the Coliseums. This is the Infinity Series. This thing, honestly, it doesn't look like any sort of maple I'm familiar with. It looks far more like a rose acre or Indian laurel, something like that. running my fingers up and down. No sharp edges on the fretboard, which is a very, very pleasant surprise because I was fully expecting cheese grater sharpness. But no, this is actually relatively smooth along the sides here. As far as up and down the neck, there are a little bit of, I wouldn't say dead spots, but just spots where you do get a little bit more buzz than others. But thankfully for, let's call it roughly a $300 base, no real actual dead spots along this instrument. It was relatively well set up right from the moment I pulled it out of the box, which was great. It does lack a little bit something as far as the tuning machines go. Not sure what brand of tuners these are, but they are extremely cheaply made and you can tell from the moment you start turning them literally every single one of these tuning machines just has that kind of cheap bass tuning gear feel to it where it feels like the groove of the gear is just kind of like falling into place a little bit as you turn it it's something i've noticed on a handful of really inexpensive instruments this is definitely no exception it just kind of feels like you need to pull it way back and then just start tuning it gradually up and up and hope to hell that those interlocking grooves stay interlocking. It just feels like it's going to pop out. Not necessarily saying it will, but that's the feeling you get when you turn this and you feel it kind of start doing this as you're tuning that gear. The nut itself, it, it seems like it's actually a pretty decent quality nut. It does kind of jut out a little bit on the sides where the frets never did. This is definitely cut just a little bit too wide compared to the rest of the fretboard. Not really 
the worst thing that can be found on an instrument of this caliber. So whatever, I'm going to let that slide because I think that that's kind of a negligible thing, especially since how often are you really gripping the thing up here? You're fretting it all up and down the neck. So having a little bit of, I guess, not being flush right up here is not the end of the world. Taking a look at the neck joint, the neck joint seems to be extremely solid. Definitely a lot less of a gap in there than I was expecting. Probably the biggest overall issue that I can find on this instrument, to be fair, is with the finish work on the body. So like the finish work on the neck, it just feels kind of cheap and it definitely feels like some sort of ancient instrument that's been hanging neglected on a wall in a pawn shop. And when you take a look at it, when you hold it in the light, you can really get an idea of what I'm talking about. There's all these dips and divots where the gloss paint is just kind of sinking in a little bit. It's something that you typically see a lot on glossy finished instruments, but this being a brand spanking new instrument, you would hope you wouldn't be seeing it to this extent just yet running your hands over it, you can even feel those dips and divots a little bit. What could be causing it? I don't know, paint settling, maybe something to do with the fact that this is such an inexpensive, cheaply made instrument. It might be down to the aging and the drying out of the body wood itself, and now the temperature is causing it to acclimate weird. I don't know, but either way, taking a look at the finish, Although smooth as it is for the most part, like there's not really any burring or anything like that. And it's just something that's kind of part and parcel with this type of finish work. But all the same, it is just kind of a bummer this being a brand new instrument and all. One other thing too, taking a look at the back of the neck, you do tend to see that there's definitely some spots where the wood is just a little bit knotty. I'm a little bit less concerned about that than a lot of other people would be. I think it honestly looks okay, and I'm also of the opinion where as long as it doesn't affect the structural integrity of the instrument in any sort of negative way, then fuck it. It's okay. As long as it doesn't affect that, as long as it doesn't affect the playability, as long as it doesn't affect the tone, okay, fine, let's move on. So, to the heart of the matter, how does this thing sound? Honestly, it sounds surprisingly really, really good. That is definitely one of the high points of this instrument, if you ask me. Now, before I move forward with that, I gotta let you know there was definitely something that was throwing me off a little bit. There is a push-pull active passive switch on here on the master volume control. Here's where it's weird for me. This is the master volume control. It is kind of in the middle of the entire control layout. The front facing knob is the blend control between the two pickups. Little less than intuitive in my opinion. So just throwing that out there, you know, I've never really found other bases where the front facing knob is not the volume. So that's just a little weird to me. But anyways, I digress into the tone demo. I am running this thing into the Neural DSP Dark Glass plugin, and this is the Alex Webster preset that comes with it. Completely stock, I have not changed any settings on it. This is with the blend set right in the middle between the two pickups. This is with all of the EQ knobs also set right in the middle too.
So treble, mid, bass. Let's put that all at noon again. Turn the bass all the way up. All the way down. Still a fair amount in there. Definitely still very articulate. Let's go with a pick. Turn the mids down a little bit. Turn the treble up a little bit. Bring it back a little bit more onto the bridge pickup. That's a little sad with how the bridge pickup sounds. I really wish that had a little bit more low end to it. Let's go all the way back. So it's just not quite all that grindy of a bridge pickup. It's the kind of thing where if you want that more low end thump in there, you really need to kind of push it with the neck pickup a little bit, just kind of blend that in. So right now I've got the blend knob just a little bit up from the midpoint. up a little bit turn the mids up a little bit and turn the bass down to about the midpoint again so mid and treble maxed Turn the treble and the bass all the way up, scooped mids. All the way up on the neck pickup. all the way up, treble all the way up, all the way on the neck pickup.
back a little bit more onto the bridge. Mm. Definitely getting more to what I like a little bit. Got the treble pumped up a little bit, mids at midway, bass is cranked up a little bit. throw on a little bit of gain. New preset, we're using the Savell grind bass preset that's on here. All EQ set to noon, right in between the two pickups. A little bit more under the neck pickup. Let's go with a little bit more low end. A little bit less treble, a little bit more mids. Dial back the mids, pump up the treble. Let's crank the treble. All the way back on the bridge pickup, nothing but. Style out all of the mid range, put the bass about halfway. A little bit more neck pickup in there. A lot of fret noise. Not necessarily the worst thing in the world, but just so you're aware it is there, this is not a fucking smooth jazz bass by any stretch. Overall, my final opinion of this instrument Oh, there's something else too. Well, the strap button is loose right off the bat. The other one isn't, okay. Anyways, my final thought on this bass. So, look, it is what it is. This is a roughly round about $300 to $350 instrument when you factor in the shipping costs. Is it decent for the money? Yes. Is it an awesome instrument by any stretch? No. Coming at it from the perspective of maybe like a bedroom guitar player, maybe a home studio enthusiast, maybe someone who just plays guitar but just wants a bass so that he can track bass parts, lay down some low end, get something a little bit more finished out there. This is going to do the fucking job. It honestly sounds way, way better than I was anticipating. It plays relatively okay, and it's the kind of thing where you can kind of bash this thing around, which is definitely how you want to play metal bass, especially when you're playing with a pick. You want to play it like it owes you money. You want to abuse it a little bit. And this thing definitely feels like something that I can abuse a little bit. Something where it responds accordingly, it gives you a little bit more fret noise, it gives you a little bit more grind and girth to it when you dig in. And that's pretty fucking cool. I think that the EQ 
is rather responsive, all things considered. I definitely, in my opinion, would much prefer this as opposed to like something like an Ibanez in the four, five, six hundred dollar price point. I definitely feel like I would appreciate the tonal characteristics of this a lot better. But I mean, it is what it is. It's a very, very cheap bass. It plays like a very, very cheap bass. But if you can hang with that, it's a very rewarding and honestly kind of inspiring cheap bass. So yeah, I think this is a keeper actually at the moment. I think I am gonna go forward with doing a future video where I convert this thing down to the lower tuning just to see how it can handle it. But yeah, overall, I would say that this is a $350 purchase that was money well spent. But Arnold, what are you drinking today? I am so glad that you asked. Let's go to the beer fridge and let's find out. Today, we are going to try this Real Ale 25th Anniversary Golden Stout. So for those of you guys that don't know, I live in the Austin, Texas area and one of the local breweries that uh, makes a lot of really incredible stuff around here is Real Ale. And recently, they're celebrating their 25th anniversary. They came out with this. It is a 6.5% alcohol by volume. This is a golden stout ale brewed with coffee and cocoa nibs, according to what the description says here. Let's dig in. Getting a lot of aroma already and I haven't even poured a drop yet. Oh, that's a very nice smell. As you can see, extreme golden color. Very, very bubbly. So the bubbles are definitely sticking to the side of the glass quite a bit for those of you guys that care about lacing and stuff like that. Mmm, bit of corn sweetness in the aroma. Mmm. Oh, that's nice. It's a stout, but it's crisp. That's interesting. So, I shouldn't say like super crisp. It's not like a lager or a pilsner, but it definitely has some similar characteristics. So it's very, very smooth, easily drinkable at 6.5%. You definitely don't get any sort of like alcohol pinch or anything. I'm definitely getting a little bit of the coffee. The cocoa nibs, not so much. Like as far as the notes that I'm getting, it's a little bit more of like, like just a little bit of fudge, less cocoa, if that makes any sense. So it's something that's a little bit smoother. It's a little bit more refined, a little bit less punch in the face feel than when you've got actual cocoa nibs in a typical cocoa nib beer. So it tastes really, really excellent, very easily drinkable. Kind of halfway between a brown ale and a stout, if that makes any sense to other beer fans out there. Hmm. Yeah, I'm quite enjoying this. This is really, really good. 25th Anniversary Golden Stout by Real Ale. So thank you guys so very, very much for tuning in. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to this channel. There's tons more metal and guitar oriented content to come. And as always, please remember, take what you do seriously, do not take yourselves too seriously.